Once upon a time, in the far west of the Iberian Peninsula, there lived a people known as the Lusitanians. Their homeland roughly corresponded to what we now call central Portugal, and stretched into some areas of modern-day Extremadura and Castilla y Leon in Spain. The tale of the Lusitanians unfolds after the Roman Republic conquered their land, incorporating it as a province named Lusitania. In the ancient S history, the origins of the Lusitanians are intertwined with tales of bravery and leadership. Frontinus, a chronicler of times past, spoke of Variathus, a Lusitanian leader who led the Celtiberians in their valiant war against the mighty Romans. The Greco-Roman historian Diodorus Siculus added to their legend, likening them to another Celtic tribe, proclaiming, those who are called Lusitanians are the bravest of all, similar to the Cimbri. The Lusitanians were also known as Belitnians, a name bestowed upon them by the diviner Artemidorus. Strabo, the wise geographer, saw them as Celtiberians who had once been Istramenes in ancient times, although archaeological findings suggest that the Lusitanians and Vetons were primarily pre-Celtic Indo-European populations that adopted Celtic cultural elements due to their proximity. However, not all scribes sang the same tune. Pliny the Elder and Pomponius Mela, in their geographical writings, painted a different picture, distinguishing the Lusitanians from their Celtic neighbors like the Artabrians. As the story continued, the original Roman province of Lusitania extended briefly to include the territories of Asturia and Galatia. Yet, fate had other plans, and soon these lands were ceded to the jurisdiction of the Provincia Terraconensis in the north. The south, however, retained its identity as the Provincia Lusitania et Vetones. Galatia, with time, would emerge as its own province, claiming much of modern Galicia and northern Portugal. The northern border of Lusitania then traced the course of the Douro River, while the eastern border meandered through Samantica and Cesaro Briga, reaching the Anas Guadiana River. And the Lusitanians found themselves entangled in the webs of conflict with the mighty Romans. These fierce warriors, once led by the renowned Variathus, had previously fought for Carthage alongside the Galaici during the Second Punic War between 218 and 201 BC. Silius Italicus, a chronicler of times long past, recounted their combined might, with Variathus at the helm, a leader distinct from the similarly named chieftain. Livy, the ancient historian, painted a vivid picture of the Lusitanians' prowess. They, along with Celtiberian cavalry, conducted daring raids in the rugged terrains of northern Italy, where even Hannibal's famed Numidian cavalry struggled to navigate. The year 193 BC marked the beginning of the Lusitanians' resistance against Roman rule in Hispania. A pivotal moment occurred in 150 BC, when Praetor Servius Galba executed a treacherous maneuver, luring and defeating 9,000 Lusitanians while selling 20,000 more as slaves in distant Gaul, modern-day France. This ruthless act etched a deep scar in Lusitanian history, fueling the rise of Variathus as their leader in 147 BC. Under his command, the Lusitanians struck back, inflicting severe damage on Roman dominion in Lusitania and beyond. However, the tale took a tragic turn in 139 BC. Variathus, betrayed in his sleep by three companions sent as emissaries to the Romans, met his end. Audax, Ditalcus, and Manurus, swayed by Marcus Papilius Linus, turned against their leader. Despite not being Lusitanians themselves, but likely Turditanians or from another people, their loyalty shifted with the promise of reward from the Romans. Yet, Rome's response was swift and ruthless. The consul Quintus Servilius Scipio, declaring, Rome does not pay traitors, ordered the execution of the three betrayers. With the death of Variathus, the Lusitanians continued their struggle under the leadership of Tartalus. As time unfolded, the tides of Romanization swept over them. Gradually, they embraced Roman culture and language, and their cities, akin to others in the Romanized Iberian Peninsula, earned the coveted status of citizens of Rome. Yet, the legacy of Lusitanian culture remained enigmatic and contentious. Scholars grappled with categorizing it, debating whether it was a pre-Celtic Iberian culture with substantial Celtic influences or an essentially Celtic culture with indigenous pre-Celtic nuances tied to the Beaker culture. As the Lusitanians forged their destinies on the battlegrounds against the Romans, their beliefs and rituals added another layer to their intricate tale. In the sacred realm of religion, the Lusitanians practiced a diverse polytheism, offering animal sacrifices to appease their pantheon of gods. Their reverence found expression in rudimentary sculptures that depicted both their deities and valiant warriors. Among these gods, Endovelicus stood as the most revered, his name echoing through the ages. 
Some speculated that he might be a deity borrowed from the Basque language, but scholars like Jose Leda de Vasconcelos contended that Indovelicus was originally Celtic, bearing the epithet, Very Good God. The comparison of his name with Welsh and Breton counterparts revealed a meaning akin to the Irish god Dogda, endowing him with the power to protect. The Romans themselves, drawn to his benevolent influence, joined in worship, and Indovelicus's cult expanded across the Iberian Peninsula and beyond, persisting until the 5th century. He became the guardian of public health and safety, a beacon of divine protection. In the southern reaches, the goddess Ada Aegina held sway, a figure beloved for her association with rebirth, fertility, nature, and healing, qualities that identified her with Proserpina during the Roman era. Her worship flourished, weaving her influence into the tapestry of Lusitanian spirituality. The Lusitanian mythology intertwined with the rich tapestry of Celtic lore, their stories and deities echoing the tales of their northern brethren. The inscriptions on ancient stones bore witness to the names Banjua and Nabia, entities deeply ingrained in Lusitanian consciousness. Banjua, sometimes linked to a specific locality, shared roots with Borvo, another deity. Nabia, a goddess of rivers and streams, reflected the Lusitanians' reverence for the natural world. However, the shadows of their religious practices cast a darker hue. Strabo recounted their penchant for sacrifice, both animal and human. The Lusitanians, diviners of fate, would inspect the vital organs and veins of sacrificial offerings, seeking signs in the entrails. In more gruesome rituals, prisoners of war faced a cruel fate, as they were struck under coarse blankets to observe the direction in which they fell. The right hands of captives were severed, offered as macabre tributes to the gods. Amidst these rituals, the language of the Lusitanians echoed through time. A Paleo-Hispanic language, it belonged to the vast Indo-European family, yet its precise affiliation remained a subject of scholarly debate. Some argued for its para-Celtic nature, emphasizing Celtic influences in its lexicon, anthroponyms, and toponyms. Another theory sought connections with Italic languages, drawing links from the names of Lusitanian deities. The complexity deepened with the suggestion that the Lusitanian language might be a basal Italo-Celtic branch, distinct from Celtic and Italic, separating early from Proto-Celtic and Proto-Italic populations. An alternative theory proposed a European branch of Indo-European dialects labeled Northwest Indo-European, associated with the Beaker culture and potentially ancestral to Celtic, Italic, Germanic, and Balto-Slavic languages. In the intricate dance of linguistics, Ellis Evans saw Galatian Lusitanian as a unified language, a P-Celtic variant. The language of the Lusitanians whispered secrets across the ages. And also, in the rugged lands between the rivers Doro and Tagus, where the winds whispered through the ancient oaks, the Lusitanians, a people of diverse tribes, carved their existence. This land, now known as Central Portugal's Beira and Estremadura regions, held the stories of these tribal confederations, each with its own territory and independence, yet bound by a cultural unity and shared name. The Lusitanians were not a singular political entity, but a tapestry woven from smaller clans, each governed by its tribal aristocracy and chief. This aristocracy, often warriors themselves, mirrored the iron-willed leaders of other pre-Roman Iron Age peoples. Each tribe danced to its own rhythm, and only in the face of external threats did the disparate tribes unite, presenting a formidable front against the encroaching storm. Variathus, a name that resonates like a distant drumbeat in the annals of Lusitanian history, emerged as the single leader during the Roman conquest. Before him, luminaries like Punicus, Corsinus, and Caesarus led the tribes, resisting Roman attempts with a resilient spirit. The unity forged in times of peril stood as a testament to their strength. The Lusitanians, renowned by historians for their prowess in guerrilla warfare, were a force to be reckoned with. The strongest among them defended their homelands in mountainous terrain, wielding hooked javelins and saunions of iron, clad in helmets reminiscent of their Celtiberian kin. From a distance, they launched their darts with uncanny accuracy, piercing through the air to find their mark and inflict deep wounds upon their foes. Active and nimble, they pursued their enemies, leaving a trail of victory in their wake. A tale etched in history recounted a narrow pass where 300 Lusitani faced 1,000 Romans. In the ensuing clash, 70 of the Lusitani and 320 of the Romans met their fate. Yet, in the aftermath, one lone Lusitani, separated from his victorious brethren, faced a detachment of pursuing cavalry. 
With a spear and a swift blow of his sword, he pierced the Roman's horse and severed its rider's head, casting a shadow of terror over the retreating enemy. In times of peace, their agility transformed into a rhythmic dance, a celebration of life that required nimbleness of legs and thighs. Yet, when the drums of war thundered, they marched in unison until the moment they were ready to charge, a synchronized force fueled by determination. Appian, the chronicler of times long past, spoke of the valiant Lusitanian women who, when Praetor Brutus sacked Lusitania after Veriathus's death, fought side by side with their men as warriors. The clash of steel and the echoes of courage resounded through the hills as the Lusitanians, with their indomitable spirit, etched their legacy into the ancient Iberia.